You are watching California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. I am glad you're with us this episode. If you're a political junkie like me, stay tuned. We'll be speaking with Ed Hernandez, a Democrat in the state Senate, and we'll look at some key races on the state Senate side. Then we're going to speak with Kurt Hagman, a Republican in the Assembly. We'll look at some key Assembly races. We'll see the different points of view, but we start with uh, Ed Hernandez, member of the California State Senate. Sir, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for the invitation. We're going to talk about four seats. We'll start at the top of the state. Okay. move down. Let's start in the Central Valley. Two assembly members running against each other. Democrat Kath Kathleen Galgiani running against Bill Berryhill, a Republican. Tell us about that seat. Well, first of all, let's talk about the first of four seats that we're trying to target. We have to pick up two of those target seats to hit the magic number of 27, which is a two-thirds vote. But I feel confident we're going to hit all four and starting off with Kathleen Galgiani. I got to tell you, that is the rallying cry for your friends on the Republican yeah. side. We can't let the Democrats get to two thirds. We can't let it happen. Well, you know what? Here's the hard reality of the state of California. It's a blue state. And whether they like it or not, the redistricting commission, which was an independent commission, keep in mind that they were upset with the results. That's the way they drew it. And we have a really good shot of picking up four of those seats, and I predict it's going to be a slim win, and we will win. Kathleen Galgiani, the polls right now are showing we're up by two points, and we win that seat. And that's interesting, because if you look at those four races that we're about to talk about, I think it's fair to say, and I'll say it, you don't have to, that that may be the toughest of the four for the Democrats. Yes. Is that a fair statement? Definitely. It is definitely the toughest. Uh, uh, Somebody remember Barry Hill is a in incredible candidate. He works hard, but at the same time, Kathleen Galgiani is works hard. She raises money. She's a very good Democrat and good fit for the district. And what's interesting about those two candidates is on the issues, they're probably not that much different. They're both pretty moderate. Yeah, I mean, if you look at Kathleen's voting record, she is probably the absolute most moderate uh, member we've had in the Assembly, and I think her voting record will translate to the Senate as well. She's a very moderate Democrat that fits that district perfectly. Let's move down to North Los Angeles County. It's actually where I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, it's Fran Pavley, a sitting Democratic senator, running against Todd Zink, a deputy district attorney running as a Republican. Interesting, uh, Fran is running in a new seat, but a lot of the same right. territory she has represented. Right. I spoke with her, she calls it Malibu to Magic Mountain. <laughs> That's what she calls that district. Right, it is definitely a new seat, not only for her, but for the party as well. She represents about half of it, but I'd say, and I will predict, Fran wins that. She's a good candidate. She's raised an incredible amount of money. Our caucus is continuing to support her 100%. But more importantly, since Tony Strickland pulled out, is running for Congress, he would have been a much tougher opponent, I think. You know, Cameron Smythe, same thing, has that institutional knowledge there in Sacramento, pulled out of the race, and we win it. I have to ask you, because you mentioned Tony Strickland. He's running for Congress against Julia Brownlee yes. in a seat that overlaps that state Senate district. Very much so. So I'm wondering, how does that play in terms of your strategy, your calculation? Well, I mean, obviously, Tony's running very hard against um, Julia. Um, that's one of the target seats at the national level. You're seeing the... So you have two target, two target seats, seats in the winner. same area. So there's a lot of mail, a lot of television. So the GOTV is going to get out. But I'll tell you what's going to get both of them over the top, hopefully, is the fact that it's a national election. President Obama, California is going to go blue. They're going to go with Obama big. And in that particular case, especially with Pavley, Obama won in that particular area, and I predict a win in that one as the well. The challenge Fran faces, if I may, Senator Pavley, is that she, I think it's fair to say, is on the left side of the Democratic caucus. And that district is, you know, it may be bluish, mm -hmm. but it's not like uh, Ms. Pavley's old seat, which was a very blue kind of west side right. liberal seat. No, no, and, and I'm not disagreeing with you, but Pavley has done well. She, her, her votes reflected, especially recently in the most budget votes, uh, how she voted. Name ID high. Name ID is high, but I'll tell you, I'll give you the counter. When Tony ran in a very similar seat, it was a very Tony kind Strickland. of Tony yeah. Strickland, when he ran for the Senate against Hannah Beth in, a, in that similar region, Tony ran kind of in the middle, and he's a pretty conservative Republican himself. Mm -hmm. So when they he run, barely won. he barely won, but he, he moved, he tacked to the middle. But when he got elected, which when he was in the Assembly as well as in the Senate, he's an extremely conservative individual. Okay, let's move to the Inland Empire. This is an exciting race yeah. for a couple of reasons. You have a targeted 
congressional race, John Tavaloni versus Mark mm -hmm. Takano. You have a targeted state Senate race, which is what we're talking about right now, Richard Roth versus Jeff Miller. And you also have an assembly race, right. which is Bill Beatty versus Ho Jose Medina, all in the same community, all targeted, three races. Right. Let's talk about the state Senate race. Richard Roth, Democrat, two-star general. His wife is the executive director of the Riverside Chamber of Commerce, running against Jeff Miller, right. a sitting assembly member. Right. Again, we could not have picked a better candidate to represent that area. It's a new seat, not only for Ron the Loveridge, the mayor of Riverside. No. Well, <laughs> he, we, we, we tried to recruit him. We tried, we worked on it, he didn't want it. His wife didn't want it. And <laughs> you hit the nail on the head. Right. We, I think we went as far as almost talking to her wife, his right. wife. I think you did. But yeah, actually or Daryl did. did. Actually, I'll we say did. It, you don't have actually to. Actually, we did. Actually, yeah. we did. But you know what? I, I've had the opportunity not only to sit down, meet Richard, the general, have lunch numerous times. I've personally have uh, put a lot of effort into this race. Been calling third house, the business interests in the in the state of California. He is a great candidate. He's a general. He's uh, very moderate for that area. His wife's in the Cal Chamber as well at, the, at that level, you but know, he will win. You know what's interesting is the other Democrat in that race was, um, what's, Clute is his last name, right. was it? Steve Clute. Steve Clute, whose wife is a UCR professor, a wonderful um, inspiration for young women. Steve Clute, a Democrat, a former member, endorsed Jeff Miller. A Republican. That was a little surprising. Yeah, you know, I think there was a little bit of bad blood. Um, obviously, the caucus and the pro tem, we spoke about it. We decided to go with uh, Richard, thinking that he'd be a better candidate, mm -hmm. a better mix, a better fit for that district. And Clute, you know, he ran a tough race. Mm -hmm. uh, he got the party endorsement because he had the ties mm -hmm. there and in traditional Democratic basis. Once we won the, the, uh, the primary, we kind of shifted the party uh, faithfuls went mm -hmm. towards uh, Roth. And I think there's probably just a little bad blood there. I understand. You know, okay, so. let's move down to San Diego. This is another barn burner, if I may say. You have George Plesha, mm -hmm. who is the former GOP leader in the Assembly. Wasn't he dethroned for being too moderate? Am I off on that? Um, it's well, hard to remember. Well, l let me say something about most of the leaders yeah. in, the, in my uh, co colleagues on the Republican right. side, on the other side of the aisle. Anytime they put up any kind of vote towards the middle, they get dethroned. Right. So that's just kind of the nature of, of the, the Republican of caucus. The Republican caucus. So George is running against Marty Block, a current member of the California State Assembly. Right. I, I was not aware that this seat was on the target list. Is this a, a, a bona fide pickup opportunity? Or is it a pickup? I'm not even sure. It's a new district. Where are we on this? It, it's not. It, it, the district changed a little bit. Um, it is traditionally has been a Democratic district. Um, I think we will and continue to maintain it. But here's the reason why I think it's considered a target or a potentially a pickup for the Republican Party is because they didn't have a candidate up until the last minute. Uh. And when George jumped in, and I, be, I will give him credit, he's mm -hmm. a great guy, I I've like him, that. he's very personable, mm -hmm. and immediately he is a good mm -hmm. candidate. Sure. Unlike, you know, Zinc that's running against Pavley, no offense to him, I've never met the guy, yeah. but he doesn't have that green. institutional One knowledge, he's new, mm -hmm. he's, he's kind of green. Whereas George, you know, he's a seasoned legislator. So right away we were concerned, but we started to kind of jump on board with Marty. Marty's working hard, he's raising money. But I will tell you, the biggest advantage we have in the state of California in the caucus is being Democrats. We can outspend them much, you know, many, many times more I've than heard they that. can to us. What about demographics? To me, that seems like an even bigger advantage. Huge demographics. I mean, if you look at the Latino vote, the African-American vote in the state of California, the communities of color. And uh, the coast. The coast, <laughs> Just the coast that's liberal. a demographic in itself. You know, I, I'll tell you, I sit, I sit on the Senate floor and I look across the room and we, we're split up to Democrats and Republicans. And, in the, and on the uh, Republican side, with the exception of the few females they have, and even then, they're all, they're all white. There is not one single minority representative in the state Senate. In the, in the Democratic side, we have all walks of life. You know, you've got Latinos, you've got API, you've got African American, you've got, you know, white, you've got liberal, you've got, you know, LGBT lesbian, community. Yeah. I mean, we represent California. And if you think about it, the California electorate elects the representation of what the state is. That's and that's why we're going to win in November. His name is Ed Hernandez, member of the California State Senate. When we come back, we're going to hear the other side on the assembly races. His name is Kurt Hagman, a Republican assembly member on Brad Palmer. We'll be right back on California Edition. <laughs> Let's
California edition. I'm Brad Palmer. Let's get ready for some fun. We are with Kurt Hagman. He is serving as the elections chair for the Republican Assembly Caucus, and we're going to be going over some assembly races that the Republicans are targeting for November for pickup. And so let's start and get right into it. We'll go from the top of the state to the bottom of the state. And I want to start with the 8th Assembly District in the Sacramento area. Well, thanks. We have um, Pierre Tahishi as our, as our candidate up there. And this let the viewers know this is an important election because these seats are for 12 years. And right. redistricting 12 years, these things are going to last a while. And the Republicans have been on the wrong side of losing seats the last decade or so. So this is a, a very exciting. We're looking at picking up five seats. And Peter's a great candidate up there. He's um, worked in federal government for a while. Now he's out there racing it. And we're very close in the polls and working hard. He's running against Ken Cooley. And what's interesting is in the primary, Cooley did significantly better than Pete by about uh, 19 points, but that doesn't tell the whole story. No, no, and, and especially when you have multiple candidates running during a time period. Right now, it's neck and neck, and we're doing our daily polls, and it's really going to be based on turnout, how that race does. And registration, about a four-point advantage for the Democrats, but we know traditionally that the Democrats need a wider registration to be considered a, quote, safe seat. So, I mean, I'm just an observer, but I can see why this is a targeted seat for the yes, Republicans. Yeah. Let's go to the next seat. This is the 32nd Assembly District. It's in the Central Valley. Also a very interesting seat, and I question why it's considered a pickup possibility because there's a 20-point Democrat advantage. It's a very different farmer mentality Democrats, very moderate Democrats there. We are candidates Pedro Rios, uh, local government. He's a farmer. He's connected He's Latino, with the people presumably. There. He's, yeah, we have a great diversity of candidates this year, and um, he is um, scoring very well. Well down there. They're working very hard as well. And the reason why we saw this on our radar is because we we have that seat right now cur currently. By who has it? By Bill Berryhill, sure. but it's a piece of that, obviously, with redistricting, but something that's been very moderate in the past, tend to vote Republican, and Romney's actually winning that, that seat over Obama right now. And what's interesting is, even though there may be a 20-point registration advantage, if you look at the June primary, while um, Rudy Salas got 41% of the vote, Pedro got 20, about 24% of the vote, if you combine all the Republican votes versus all the Democratic votes, the Republicans got more votes in June. Absolutely. So and we're seeing this trend up and down the state. We're actually doing much better than registration in all our seats right now. I think people feel comfortable being registered Democrats, but they're actually kind of going against their grain looking for a change right now. And it's typical when uh, people are not happy. Although the challenge becomes California is a blue state. Romney is not contesting this state. President Obama won this state 61-39. That's quite a blowout. And in 2010, as the Republican wave was crashing across the nation. If the Rockies stopped. It, even, well, <laughs> more the Sierras. Yeah. I mean, it actually went to Colorado and Utah, yeah. but it didn't get past the Sierras. So challenges, no doubt. Absolutely. This has been a traditionally red seat. You know, we've had our moments with Reagan and Wilson and, and mm, gubernatorial yes. stuff. Um, and I think, again, people stand to stick with their party, but may vote other ways. And we see a bigger trend of more and more independents and decline to state voters. Well, that's for sure. And that's who we're going after all the time. 49th Assembly District. That is in the San Gabriel Valley. This is a fascinating one because registration favors Democrats by about 14, 15 points. But in the primary, Dr. Matthew Lynn, the Republican candidate, won outright more than 50% of the vote to Ed Shaw, who got about 35% of the vote. That's an interesting one. It is, and again, that goes to the strength of the candidate. Um, it's a very diverse um, district, and um, he's been working in local government for a long time. He's a success story in his own, um, self-made you know, businessman. But it's a fascinating seat because you have an Asian American running against a Latino American. Uh, oh, Ed no, Shaw, no, he's also, it's, oh, it's, Asian. it's two Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. Is the seat a, quote, Asian American seat? About a, about a third Asian, and then about a third uh, Latino, and about a third other, and it's a very diverse so seat. So, so it's still, it still begs the question, I mean, obviously the Asian American community, I mean, look, no community votes monolithically, but you know, you gotta wonder where the Latino vote will go. Well, and we they actually, Democrats had a Latino candidate at the beginning of the primary, but they pulled out because Dr. Lim was doing so well. Interesting, okay, let's go to the Inland Empire, uh, the 61st assembly seat. Now, this one is a barn burner in large part because uh, in this area, the Riverside area, you have a contested congressional seat, you have a contested state senate seat, and a contested assembly seat. And a supervisor seat. And too. a supervisorial <laughs> race as well. So mm -hmm. there is no doubt that a lot of money, a lot of mail is flowing into the seat. Let's talk about Ground it. zero for some of the elections here. No, at all, I mean, all of those seats, it's uh, Tavaloni versus Takano, 
it's Jeff Miller versus Richard Roth. And now in the on the assembly side, it's Republican Bill Beatty versus Democrat Jose Medina. Yeah, and Bill Beatty is an excellent candidate for us. He's, he's very moderate, so he fits the district. He's a firefighter. He's been on council for, Is I he African-American? He is, uh, he's self-proclaimed or uh, proclaimed. proclaimed as a black Latino. So he's half black and half Latino. Which, I mean, for better or for worse, that's new. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of the Republican Party. The Republican Party has not been known for no, we have fielding a, diverse candidates. Yeah, we, we definitely have our, our share this year, which is fantastic for us. And he's um, very well known in his home city because he's been on council for 12 years. Uh, firefighters, he's getting support us in the labor union. So he's not a traditional, right. you know, very right, right wing candidate makes it in. He did very well, and we, we believe he's going to pick up that seat. So uh, registration about a plus five ish Democrat advantage. Um, but again, how does it play when you have so many contested seats? literally right on top of each other. Yeah, it really, you don't know. Um, we're trying to use models. You can't use the 2008 model because that was a huge turnout for Obama year. Um, do we go for the off years when, you know, those type of things. Right. So it really depends what numbers you use and what the turnout is. Traditionally, Republicans turn out more in percentage wise than Democrats. So if we're within five points, it looks good for us. Uh, but you never know until the turnout comes out. What about the growing Latino community in areas like the Inland Empire, the San Gabriel Valley, the Central Valley? I, mean, I think it's fair to say the Republican Party has faced challenges as it relates to Latino voters. And one could argue the case may not have been made stronger by some statements made by the Republican nominee for President Mitt Romney. Absolutely, and we are trying to do a much better job this last couple of years of reaching out to the Latino community. We're recruiting Latino candidates. Um, we have a couple more safe Republican seats that are coming in, so we'll have a much diverse, much more diverse party coming up here this, this next session. Um, regardless of the outcome of these races, we have some that are automatically in safe Republican seats. So um, we're looking forward to bringing more in. The, the issues we find out their community, uh, you know, immigration is way down on their list. It's more of the same things that the rest economy. of the have. The economy, economy. jobs, schools, One safety. more seat. One more seat, Kurt. And that is the 66th Assembly District. South Bay Area. Uh, South Bay Area, Redondo Beach. This is an interesting one because the Republican is Craig Huey, and we know that name because he ran against Janice, Janice Hahn, Hahn in a congressional seat. Now, I don't think a lot of folks expected Ms. Hahn to lose. Uh, it's a fairly Democratic seat on the congressional side, but it got closer than many thought. I mean, he only lost by 10 points. Now, that may not seem like a close race, but the registration was much greater. So he's energizing. He's energizing, and as well as um, his name ID is high because he just got out of that election. Right. And now he's running the state assembly. He just kind of like kept going for his campaign, and he's doing very well down there. Again, that's something we expect to pick up, and Craig's doing a wonderful job. The challenge, though, um, for better or for worse, he has been um, named a member of the Tea Party. Well, I don't even know what that means anymore, but how does that play in the South Bay? Because, you know, when I think of the South Bay, I think of, yeah, they're conservative forces, but they're also probably pro-choice, and they're probably more pro-environment than others, and so. Yeah, and for me, I grew up in South Bay. Okay, I grew up so in House Birdies. Okay. More fiscal conservative, more right. liberal on the social issues, right. more the coastal liberals, we would call them. Exactly. Um, that basically watch the, the dollars. So if economy and the taxation and those type of state budgets stay on the radar, I think Craig pulls out. If the discussions go toward, you know, some of the environmental issues and stuff, then he won't have as much to, to battle out with his opponent. So how do you see turnout? Uh, I mean, look, as we speak today, we know that people have been voting. I mean, I, I have voted already. We know that early voting is running rampant. And so it, it really changes the way that you run a campaign. Uh, we have two targets. We have the absentee voters that right. we target, as well as the poll voters, and it's been growing, like you said, each um, year, more and more absentee My voters. My wife is getting called every day, every <laughs> single day, and it's interesting. It's not by a candidate. It's a proposition. Yeah, and lots of money is being spent uh, on 30 and, and 32. It, it, oh, and when the, we got the call last night, I said, she's not here, but just so you know, she's already voted. You don't need to call anymore. And so it's interesting how focused even the propositions are. Yeah, and um, you know, for a good campaign, they know who's voted because they go back to register voters and find no out when they get them. His name is Kurt Hagman, member of the California State Assembly. When we come back, we're going to be speaking with Anita Gabriellian. She is a member of the Glendale Community College District. I'm Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back. California. <laughs>
Welcome back to California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. I'm glad you're with us today. I'm glad to introduce you to Anita Quinones Gabriellian. She is a member of the Glendale Community College District trustee, and I thank you so much for joining us, Anita. I want to talk to you about the challenges facing community colleges yes. generally. Why don't you give us a sense of those challenges? Uh, incredible challenges. First of all, Brad, it's a pleasure to be here thank with you. you. And thank you to Charter thank for you. this uh, wonderful opportunity to talk about uh, community colleges and the challenges. Um, first, let me tell you that the California Community College system is the system that offers the largest vocational training not only in California, but in the entire nation. No, that's a true statement. I mean, Absolutely. There are 72 districts, 112 colleges, one quarter of all U.S. community college students live in California. Exactly. It's that exactly. simple. I mean, we are, we are the ones that uh, train our nurses, our firefighters, uh, police, uh, on and on, and several other 175 different fields of study. But the challenge is, if you look at community college rates, they are spiking. Last year, uh, the California Community College system had the steepest spike in the nation. 37% increase. It's still lower than other states, but that is a burden on many students. It is. It's absolutely a burden. It's a decision that uh, everyone, government, uh, is has made to actually put the increases in taxes in terms of fees on students, on the people who can afford it the least. In the last four years, community colleges has, have seen an incredible cut in budget. As a matter of fact, 24% of our classes have gone away. Well, and, and the reason it's, it, it's so important immediately is that in a few days, well, it, on November 6th in the elections, we are going to have the opportunity to make a decision for the youth, for education, for California um, that is incredibly significant and impactful when you hopefully support Proposition 30. And let's talk about the initiatives that will be on the ballot in November, as you mentioned. There are two initiatives that deal with education. Um, one is Prop 30, supported by the governor. Mm -hmm. It would increase sales tax by a quarter cent for four years, increase taxes on the wealthy for seven years. Right. The other initiative, Prop 38, increases income tax on all. And the money goes to education, but as I understand it, not community college education. Exactly. It is a flawed proposition. Um, 38 is, uh, completely ignores the fact that in order to make sure that we have a successful California and continue to provide a ready workforce and fuel the economic engine that is California, uh, it just totally ignores community colleges. Proposition 30 is the right answer for California. Here's a challenge, though, as I see it. Uh, you look at Proposition 30 on the ballot, and it's an increase in taxes. And Californians haven't increased taxes on themselves in eight years. We had a cigarette tax on the ballot in June. It's not Kentucky, and yet that went down. We also have an extension of a transportation tax in LA, in LA County, the largest county in the state. That will be on the ballot. The Amazon tax has just kicked in. The lumber tax is kicking in. I mean, a lot of taxes being presented before us. So as you speak with your constituents in Glendale and otherwise, what are you saying to them in terms of your support for an initiative at a time when a lot of tax is coming at us? Exactly. I think, you know, we always have our economic ebbs, you know, ebb and flow here. It is a time to decide. Mm -hmm. um, we have, for the last four years, disinvested in education. When you look at community college education, a $1 investment gives you $4.50 in return. Where are you going to put your money? You know, we have, the census showed us that the two largest groups are the youth. We've got those in 20 to 24 age range, which are community, which are college students right now. We've got the largest group, 15 to 19. They are only 18 ones. And it's mm -hmm. our decision to make. You know, we have a proposition that is very thoughtful, that um, is, is balanced 
it does not go after the lowest income people you know, in uh, uh, comparison to Prop 38, which which taxes even the lowest income. It, I mean, so it, that, it, I mean it, it is a fact. I mean, Prop 38 taxes 0.4% to 2.2% on a sliding exactly. scale. One could argue that the sales tax, it applies to everyone, but on the income tax side, there's no doubt that any increases will go to the wealthiest among us. But still, I want to really get a sense from you. I mean, you're out there, you're in the field, you're talking to constituents, you're in Glendale, which I think in a lot of ways is a, it's a microcosm in some ways of our state. Um, there are some uh, very well healed communities, some communities that are a little more challenged, uh, great ethnic diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you hearing from your constituents? Because look, if Prop 30 doesn't pass in Glendale, it's not passing in the state. I think that's a fair statement. Exactly. Um, I'm fortunate that I have been hearing a lot of very positive things for Prop 30. And it is a matter, as I said, of deciding to invest in education. Where, you know, it, it's really, if you look at it, the bottom line is a few dollars, even if you're somebody making, say, $24,000 a year, it means about $25 for an entire year more that goes to education. And that education is, is, it's a conscious decision to invest in that versus additional social programs or the prison system. Face it, take a look at how the prison system looks. One of the metrics they use is high school dropout rate. If the high school dropout rate is lower, they have to budget for additional prison facilities, management, staff, et cetera. It's time to decide for our youth, not just for our youth, for a ready workforce, for the economy in California to invest in education and support Prop 30. And as I understand it, California will need 2.3 million more community college degree holders by 2025. And as we speak today, the community college population has dropped 500,000 in the last four and five years. We also know that sections have dropped over 100,000 in the last Absolutely. four or five years. So the challenges are great. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about some challenges of your sister community college districts like Cuesta, like Humboldt, Redwood City, like San Francisco City College, the largest community college in the nation. They are all facing accreditation crises. Exactly. What do you make of that? Well, I think that it, what happens is you, you don't provide a system with the resources necessary to educate our students. And it, it places them in the type of decisions that San Francisco is facing, uh, that Humboldt is facing. And so the answer, the answer is to decide where you want to invest your dollars. I think it's, it's that simple. If you provide the resources and you make the right decisions to invest in the right things, then it will fuel. The decisions we make today are going to impact mm -hmm. higher education for the next 10 years. What happens if Prop 30 does not pass? If Prop 30 does not pass, we have failed an entire generation. We're talking about the youth, we're talking not, not just a generation on a personal level, but we failed our community who now has um, youth that are growing up unproductive. We now have made a decision to probably uh, increase funding for the prison system, for social programs, instead of programs that will provide and have our community continue to contribute. You know, if you contribute, if Prop 30 passes, or even if a student, if a student is allowed the resources to graduate from college, they make a million three hundred and forty thousand dollars more, which results in taxes, which results in contributions to the community, which results in lower social programs and less prison funding. So it's a choice between, you know, a productive, successful California and not. Her name is Anita Gabrielian, a member of the Glendale Community College District. My name is Brad Pomerantz. We thank you so much for watching Charter California Edition.